set up. I don't know if it's necessary to move all the way out there, but you can if that's what you want to do. But every other pew is marked off, which gives you six foot spacing. If you know, if you're not family and not together, you need to set on each end. But <clears throat> but I would like this row right here. What you got one two or three pews, whole pews available. And over here you got this middle pew, second pew available. And yeah, every other pew is marked off. So there's six, there's about six foot spacing between them, something like that. So if you want to, Brother Keith, this second pew down here is empty. Yeah, that's that's fine. If y'all want to keep your spacing, if y'all are, you know, it's okay. It just, you know, the further apart you get, the little colder it gets sometimes as far as worship's concerned. Not, not, not temperature wise. Uh huh. Yeah, it does. Right. Okay, and then they've got the, except for families together, they've got the band pretty well spaced apart, too, so it's, and you don't have to necessarily, you don't have to stay in the band. We thought maybe it might be necessary because, uh, uh, but it looks like there's plenty of room for people to go back to where they were. We just, the only reason we thought maybe people might need to stay in the band was because we didn't know if there'd be enough spacing of course, we're just going to try to hold them to these pew pews, but it's okay if that's what, if y'all want to stay spread out a little bit more, it's all right. All right, God bless. Let's just have church and see what happens. Then a little bit later on about maybe possible Wednesday night services and, and, uh, further about what we're thinking about. Anyway, let's just have church this morning.
we have come into this place gathered in his name to worship him we
bless your name, Lord. I'll bless your holy name. I will stand in the sanctuary and bless your
the Lord. I praise him. I magnify him. I honor him. I praise God for keeping us. Hallelujah. I thank God. I thank God. I thank God. I thank God. That's what I came here for. I'm glad to be back in the house of the Lord. I am. I'm glad to be back. You know, I was getting excited, you know, been calm. It's been a while, you know. And, and, and you miss the people of God when you're not around them. You know, uh, sometimes you think you could do without them. But that's not so. That is definitely a trick of the enemy right there. <laughs> they say straight from the pits of hell. <laughs> you need the people of God. You need his people. Hallelujah. It's nothing like the people of God. I praise God today for his mercy. I thank God for keeping us, you know, in this time. Hallelujah. And continuing to keep us, you know. So I'm grateful this morning. 
this afternoon, too. But I am grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm glad to be home. Glad to be back at home. Amen. Um, a lot's happened over the past month, um, uh, with my family. I just, I don't know. I felt the need to share it cause it, it kind of eats at you sometimes. And I have all you wonderful people to help me and my family carry the, the strain. Um, my nephew, he's 16. His name's Kai. And, uh, at the beginning of all this, he went to the hospital because he couldn't breathe. Um, uh, it turns out that he had an infection in his heart and it was destroying parts of it. Um, throughout the past weeks, I mean, they've gotten rid of the infection and they replaced a few pieces of his heart and um, he he started getting stronger and they were thinking that he might be able to go home um and thank the lord that he started getting um a nosebleed and it wouldn't go away so they decided to keep him one more night well his heart failed again that night and um, if he would have gone home he would have died but he was at the hospital and now he's on a machine that's um pumping his heart for him um and they're, he, he's, he's okay, he's awake again, and they're trying to get him back up to the strength that he could go home. And uh, it's just been very hard because, you know, it's my brother's youngest son, and he was always, you know, healthy, and he played football and basketball, and then, you know, this happens, and... Uh, it's so scary, and I don't even know what it's like for him because I haven't been able to talk to him. Thankfully, uh, my brother and his wife have been able to be there in the hospital with him, um, but it's just out of nowhere. Like, they, they said that, you know, nothing happened. There wasn't any way to prevent it. It was just wrong place, wrong time, and it happened. But uh, he's still alive, and I'm very thankful for that. And I know that God had his hand in that nosebleed to keep him at the hospital. And I'm very thankful, and I'm thankful to be here. And, you know, um, I can't help it, but praise him. And I, from the top of my lungs, I was like, oh, my God, when I get there, I'm going to do it. And I did. And, and they're going to call now. <laughs> but it's okay because it's for God. But, um, you know, every day, every day, I don't, you know, through all this mess, I'm still thankful because he woke me up every morning. And every day I praised him every day. That, Thank you, Lord. I know you've got something for me to do because even though I'm, gonna, I'm here at home, but I can do it through prayer, through calling somebody. And, and I feel like, you know, he led me mentally. People would come to my mind and I would text them or I would call them and so forth. And I, I feel like, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, I haven't been far away from God, but I feel closer. I mean, this has brought me so much closer to him and, and wants me to, I want, makes me want to serve him more in, <laughs> through his people. I mean, through, you know, everything that I, through my and any way that I can. And I mean, I can't um, do certain things, but I can, I can pray. I can holler. Can I can, I can, cause I, you know, like a lot of people have such a beautiful voice. Oh, I've enjoyed, oh, I've enjoyed all the songs and, 
Let me tell you, I don't want to be negative, but my Wi-Fi, I think somebody told me it's because so many people are on Wi-Fi and, and it's affecting our area where, Brother Smith, I didn't get to hear you the last three, I think the last four services, four, you know, in other words, two Sundays and two Thursdays, but it came back um, this Thursday and I, I didn't realize it till too late. I go, oh my goodness. You know, because I pressed a play on a song. I thought it was Sister Amanda, and I thought maybe I'll, I'll listen on and off. I listened to the whole song. Oh my goodness, Brother Smith! I go back, and it was already too late. But I waited, and I got to listen to you, and I went back and listened to the others. And I'm so thankful that I can do that. That it allows me to to go back. I don't have to be right there at the moment. You know, I'd like to be there at the moment, but I, you know, couldn't this last two times. But I guess a lot of people are going out now, and they're off their phones. <laughs> Because the Wi-Fi's back, and I'm so thankful for that. And uh, I'm thankful for all the songs. Like I said, all this, you know, you people that got a voice, use it. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I've never had a fantastic voice, but I had a voice that I could sing. I would, believe it or not, I sang in the radio with my dad and my sister back when I was young. Sang in jail houses, rest homes, nursing homes, everywhere. And, and I enjoyed it, you know. I wasn't showing up for it because I didn't have a voice to show off. I just loved singing to the Lord. And I did the alto, so I harmonized. And even when we had choirs here in the church, I was in every choir. And every time somebody wanted to sing, hey, I'll sing with you, you know. <clears throat> Let me sing with you. You know, one time I told Brother Boy, Brother Boy, we need to sing, you know, how great they are together. Yeah, we did. And I, I just love to sing. But now I can't as much. I'm not going to say I can't. I can if God you know, allows it to because he has <clears throat> when the radio, when the, I have gospel music on and I join along with, oh, my voice hasn't gone, you know, and I still can sing. So that's why I'm just encouraging you people. Oh, my goodness, y'all have beautiful voices. Sister Jody does it all the time, and I'm thankful for her voice. And, oh, all of you, I'm sorry just to name out one person, but my brain's all of a sudden died. And, uh, but I do love, I love to hear all of y'all singing, and <clears throat> I love to hear the word of God and, and Brother Smith, you kind of, um, it didn't, it made me a little sad, but um, maybe you can encourage me because you mentioned something about it took you 25 years to get, you know, because he said, don't get discouraged if you don't get it right now, because I don't get it, a lot of that stuff you talked about. And he said, it took you 25, I don't have 25 years, you know, and uh, I just know that. I know my son one time said, Mom, just keep on reading because I read faithfully, but I don't understand a lot of it. He goes, just keep reading and keep asking God for wisdom and understanding, and, and he will eventually, you know, lighten up, uh, you know, reveal. And I know he has a few times, and, um, but I, I, want, I don't want that to stop me from making it. I want to make it. I want, that's the highest calling that I want to do is I want to make it with God's people. I want to go. I don't want to stay behind. I want to do everything I can to be right there with y'all. And that's why my desire, that's why I'm so, so thankful I get to come to church. And I know that I've had my own little services at home, but it's not the same, you know. <clears throat> and uh, I was able to also do hear Brother Elias Cibrian this morning and and before I got, but then I had to stop in the middle of it because I had to get ready to come here. But um, I, I, I just, that's one of my prayers. I guess God, give me a deeper hunger for you, for your word. Give me a deeper understanding, whatever you want me to. And I always pray before I come to church, whatever Brother Smith talks, but Lord, please help me enlighten my brain. Let me understand what I'm supposed to understand and, and to live by your word, not just talk it, but live it. But anyway, I, um, I'm i sorry. I, I'm behind in my crying, okay? So I'm just thankful. I'm thankful that I'm, I'm so happy. Like this morning, the girls, I was reading my card that my son and daughter-in-law gave me. And I always told my son, if it makes me cry, you're done good. Well, I was crying. And, and they go, it's okay, Nana. I said, honey, Nana's not sad. Nana's happy. I said, because daddy and mommy made me cry. And I was, <laughs> And they just looked at me like, okay. I said, you'll understand when you get older. But anyway, uh, I'm thankful for all of you mothers here. <clears throat> Happy Mother's Day to all of y'all and Sister Smith, our mother of the church. And um, I love all of y'all.
Okay, Brother Smith. Brother Smith asked me to testify, and and I was thinking about what I was going to testify about, but um, um, he's wanting me to share wanting me to share what happened to me over these uh, last couple. It's been almost two months for me. I know it's been only like a month for everybody else, but I've been quarantined. I've been in quarantine a little bit longer. Uh, I had a very eventful experience. I know I've shared with you all about my program and how I got up, and I was saying, man, if things could only get worse, and they did. <laughs> and I was like, no, <laughs> this is a nightmare. I um, was in clinical, and I was exposed to the virus. And um, I'm the reason why Pulaski, sh um, the technical college over in North Little Rock got shut down was in the news, like literally respiratory student was exposed, we're shutting down the college. And I was like, oh my goodness. Not, none of my classmates could know who it was until they had everything figured out. Everybody was freaking out. I was freaking out. I remember calling Sister Smith and Brother Smith, like I don't know what to do, I want to be careful. This is very, un, this is new, this is all new, we're scared. And, and so I was like, I just want to do what's best for everyone. <laughs> And so I uh, just, I, well, I was being told, you really need to stay home until we know. And, and that's exactly what I did. But anyway, things turned out okay. I'm obviously okay. Um, but of course, my, my school was shut down, as long as everyone else's. And my program is, was at a very weird place because it is a respiratory program, and this is a respiratory virus. And so we were kind of unsure what was going to go on. We were trying to figure out how we we're going to replace clinicals because you're supposed to graduate in May and you need clinical hours and you have to pass your classes. You have to take a board exam. And I was so overwhelmed. I was like, this is just like, I don't even know what to do anymore. Um, a lot of praying, a lot of panic attacks, anxiety attacks. <laughs> What's going to happen? What are we going to do? But anyway, God made it work. Uh, they found out how to replace my clinical hours. They got me through school. And I'm graduating next week. I passed all my classes. <laughs> I'm getting a temporary license for six months. I don't have to take a big test until then, so I have plenty of time to study. Um, I was thankful for that. I was like, oh, wow, that, like, whew, you know, thank Jesus, I'm graduating. And I, work, I, and you all know, I work at Children's as a respiratory tech. And things were very busy at work. We got scared. We didn't have the, enough equipment. It was scary. We didn't know what was going to happen. We had to come up with a game plan. We had to come up with policies. It was chaotic. We had to order stuff. Things, every, all the country was out of everything, and, including Children's Hospital. But anyway, things got worked out. They figured out a plan how we're going to do this. So what Children's decided was to empty out the hospital, no surgeries, nothing, um, because the kids weren't being affected like the adults. And we were going to take the overflow for the adult hospitals because we were expecting it to get really, really bad. So they laid me off. I lost my job. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> like this is getting worse. I thought this was good. And I was promised a job at Children's when I graduated. And they were straight up like, sorry, there's no jobs now. And so I was like, oh, I've been here for five years. Like, I'm not, I don't like that. <laughs> so once again, panic attack, anxiety attack. What am I going to do? That was my job. I love children. I love kids. I don't want to work with adults. <laughs> I want to work with kids. And so I was just like praying about it. I was like, man, I'm just going to have to go get a job at Big Baptist. And I love Big Baptist. So that was my second option. I really wanted to go to the VA, but they weren't hiring either. Because I still love the VA too. But uh, I went to Big Baptist. I, I called. I was like, look, this is my situation. I would love to work for you all. I love Baptist. They had a good clinicals. And I was just praying, you know, maybe this was meant to be. Maybe this was meant to be. Like maybe God wants me out of children's and he wants me somewhere else. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do this, but okay. Because, you know, I want to do what I want to do. <laughs> and so I was like, I really want to stay with the kids. And so... I called Baptist. They, they set me up an interview the next day. They're like, yes, come see us. And I was like, okay. So I went. I was excited. I was all, you know, I'm going to be professional. I'm going to print off my resume. And I went. And I loved it. It was good. She offered me a full-time job at night. So I was like, yes. Okay, I guess this is what I want. I got in my car, started driving, and my boss started calling me. And he asked me what I was doing. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm just driving. <laughs> 
And he's like, he's like, are you at Big Baptist? And I was like, oh, no. I was like, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> but anyway, he was not, I mean, he was a little upset. He was like, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? I was like, well, I, I want a job. Like, I, I gotta, I'm getting out of school. This is what I got to do. I, I, got, I took out loans for this. I got to make some money, you know. Like, the adult hospitals, they need me. They, they need respiratory therapists right now. And he's just like, oh, he's getting all mad. He's getting all mad. And he's like, I'm calling to tell you that Randy's going to give you a job. And I was like, oh, no. And he was like, yes. And it was like almost 10 times more than money Baptist was going to offer. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I was like, you're joking. And he was like, yes, we're so sorry this happened. We're sorry we had to let you go. We're wanting you to come back. And that was, you know, that's all in the plan. He's like, don't go to Big Baptist. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man. So I was just really thankful because, like, this was just a long drawn. I was at home, like, what's happening? Like, I have done this program. I had invested time and money and had lots and lots of nights without any sleep. Clinicals were horrible. It was a nightmare. I was scared when I was exposed, and, and I was afraid I had affected my entire class. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And then they were like, we're shutting down the school. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Like, this is my luck. Like, this is seriously, this would only happen to me. And so... <laughs> I was just so thankful. I was like, like that was the time, once again, I was seeing what was happening around me, and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go somewhere else. Obviously, this isn't working out, and I was praying, and I thought, I'm going to have to take this into my hands. <laughs> Went to Big Baptist, and sure enough, God was working. He was always working. He had a plan. It was never, you know, meant for me to freak out and panic. <laughs> But I'm just really thankful um, because it it was stressful. It was just like, it was just a reassuring feeling that everything's okay. I got this. Don't worry, you know. Like, you know, I got your back. I'm like, you just need to chill. <laughs> so anyway, I'm just really glad to be here. It's good to see you all again. Um, just pray for me. I still, I'm not done, done with school. There's a lot of weird things going on right now. I've got a lot of checkoffs and requirements that have to be done before next week and I'm trying to get them done this week my whole program is because it's a disaster we have to go to different places to get things done and it has to be done in the right way with the amount of people that are trying to get degrees too we're not the only program so just remember us um, and then I still have to take that really big test and it's a big big test it's very expensive and I really want to pass so yeah just remember me and I will continue praying for you all I'm thankful to be here today and I'd like to say happy Mother's Day to all you mothers. We, uh, we're privileged to have good mothers in this church, good examples, and uh, faithful, faithful mothers. That's so important. And uh, myself, I just I count it a privilege to, to be here with you today. What a, what a time we're in, huh? And I'm going to be brief. Um, you know, the, I just wanted to let the Lord know, and I want y'all to know, that I'm happy to be in church today. We, um, we, we're going through a, a, a time of change for our country, for the world. I, I think Brother Smith put it appropriately that God surely is in this considering the effect and the impact that it's had on the world. I, I work for a man... Uh, he's always, uh, he's a cautiously skeptic, uh, towards things, events like this, you know, and there's a lot of, there's still a lot of unanswered questions for a lot of people. And I, I made mention to him, I said, regardless, it's a crisis, whether it's manufactured or otherwise, it's still a crisis and we're still going through it and it's still impacting all of our lives. And what a privilege it is 
What a privilege it has been and continues to be for us to be able to trust in the Lord. To put our life and our hope in His hands. And uh, I have a saying that I've, I've said for many years. Um, be patient or you'll become a patient. And uh, I have a tendency to get in a hurry when I'm doing things. Um, you know, wielding a chainsaw or, or uh, you know, a knife or something like that. You get in a hurry and next thing you know, you've hurt yourself. And uh, so I, I remind myself, hey, uh, young fella, I still say young fella. Hey, young fella, slow down. You know, don't get yourself hurt. And I was thinking about this scripture here in, in um, James, uh, the first chapter. I just want to read it briefly and, and uh, just, just encourage you today. It says, my brother, in James 1 and verse 2, he said, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. We're coming to a place in our lives. There, we will find ourselves, we'll find a time in our lives where all of our hope, all of our resource, all of our refuge, all of our joy, all of our expectation will solely rest in the hands of the Lord. And what a wonderful day that will be. What a day that will be when we can cease from our labors and come to rest and trust in the, in the mighty hand of God. Wow! Praise God! That's, we're learning that. We're even through this time that we're in, we're learning that we can put our trust in an uncertain time in a time when there's so much confusion and so much misinformation and so many questions that, that just kind of surround us, whether it's our jobs or our home life or even whether we can even have church or whether we're at, 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 uh, legally able to congregate together. When there's so many questions, we can still put our trust in the Lord. And that's what we've done, saints of God. We've trusted in the Lord. Hallelujah! And that's why when we come into this house today, we can lift our hands up and we can begin to sing the songs of glory because we know that we're serving a mighty God. He's bigger than all of our problems. He's bigger than all of our fears. He's bigger than all of our questions. Hallelujah. He's a mighty God and we're His children. Praise God. What a privilege it is to be in the house of the Lord today. And again, I'd like to say Happy Mother's Day to all you ladies. It's, I, it's such a privilege to be able to come back to church on such, a, on such a fine occasion. Praise God. And also I want to express my gratitude for those that worked yesterday. We had such a, a joyful spirit up here working together. And if, if you weren't here, you missed it. Even Brother Smith was up here with his mower and he was, had a big old grin on his face and he was helping us. And uh, I think one of, the, one of my girls said, Dad, I think he was looking for somebody else's yard to mow. He seemed like he's enjoying himself so much. <laughs> We had a good time. I love y'all. I'm happy to be in the house of God today. Praise God. counted the days that we could could be in service. I'll tell you what, I miss church. I really miss church. Well, today is a happy day for me, and it's an also sad day. Four years ago today, we, my husband was having his funeral today. So it's a sad day, but I'm glad that we can still be happy. And I'm thankful for the life that we've had, that we had together. And I was so happy that, that he come into the body. And uh, I was, well, I wouldn't be here today if he if had not been for him. Because after he come out of service, 
uh, we settled in Missouri. And if he had been the type husband that I've seen over the years of other people, uh, he would not have come back to Arkansas. But I had a dream one night, way during the night, and our daughter was five months old. She was the only, uh, only uh, grandbaby of the family, first and only. And uh, I woke up during the night crying. And, of course, it upset him. He didn't know what was wrong with me. And usually when he gets sick, I would worry. And when he gets, I get sick, he get worse. So anyway, I told him my dream. I said I had a dream. And I dreamed that. And I know the Lord was dealing with me. And I dreamed that we was out in a big field working, which we were farmers. And... Uh, I dreamed that big stones was falling all around me. And I went down on my knees in the dust, and I said, Lord, please, please don't let none of those stones hit me and kill me until we can get back to where we can go to church. Well, we lived in Missouri, and there was churches of the body all around. But, of course, see, I didn't, I'd never been to any of them. That's when we just first, you know, come into the body. But anyway, uh, I told him my dream in the middle of the night. I'd been just a crying and a crying. So anyway, uh, he said, when I got through telling him the dream, he said, when we get this crop over, it's in the fall of the year, he said, when we get this crop done, we'll go down and find a place and we'll, that's where we can go to church. And I was so thankful. And I thank the Lord many times for that because he could because we was doing good. We was good, do, you know, doing real good at farming and all. And uh, he could have easily said, well, we're not leaving, you know. But I was so happy that he didn't. But anyway, we moved. And so I'm so thankful that he was easy to get along with and he was happy to come into the church. And so anyway, today, like I say, I'm sad, but yet I'm happy. And uh, the Lord has been good to us, and I'm so glad that I can still be here. And uh, my children went with me, and we went out to the cemetery. And uh, one day this week, it was real pretty, beautiful day, and put uh, flowers on this grave and on my mother's grave. And uh, so I, uh, I looked at this picture when I went in the bedroom, and I said, I'm so thankful that you're in the body of Christ. I talked to him. I know that sounds silly, but does good for me. <laughs> so anyway, so much for that. I'm happy today to be here. I'm just thrilled to be here because uh, you know what? This is not just another church. This this is a very very important church, and and it'll depend on this church whether we make it or I mean depend on us whether we make it or not because I'm so thankful that we have found the right way. And I always hope, Lord, I don't want to be deceived. I want to know the right way. And so today I'm so happy to be here. And I'm glad that the Lord give me strength that I can be here. And because every time that church time comes and we can't come, I feel so lonesome, you know. I miss you people. I love you people. I mean, you know, we've been together for so long. You think like we think like each other. We we know what each other feels like and we speak each other's language. And so we're just we're we have a kindred spirit. So today I'm happy to be here. I'm thrilled to be here. And um, I I just I just couldn't wait hardly for time to come. So anyway, Let's go for the Lord. I'll tell you, he's great, and he's wonderful, and I'm so happy to be here. Bless the Lord. I'm very, very, very thankful to be back in here. Uh, I could elaborate on different things, but... Again, happy Mother's Day to all you mothers, 
Some of us don't have our mother anymore, but she was a tough love. I'll just say it that way. Um, and I want to remember some of the other mothers. And since I looked over your direction, Sister Adams, Sister Spencer, Elder Sister McGowan, Sister Woodson, Sister Foster. Oh, yeah, well, I can't forget Sister Foster. It was, this church was started in their home back, back in 1961. So I can't forget Sister Foster. Sister House, Sister, uh, I think I already said Sister Woodson, Sister um, uh, PV, Ken Singer. Go ahead. I don't mind you telling me the names because I'm getting, I hate good Sister Bullock. I'm starting to get old and starting to forget. So I'm thankful for any help or feedback I can get. But I'm very thankful to be in the body of Christ today. I want to let, and plus I'm from Missouri. So instead of just saying, I'm happy to be in the body of Christ, I want you to know I am happy and thankful and enthusiastic because I enjoyed the messages. I think there was at least 12 or 13 messages over Facebook. But I'd rather be with you instead of just looking at you. So, you know, there's a lot of things I could elaborate on and make, uh, make more of a story about this uh, situation. But just think. We're thankful to be back in the body of Christ in this church. And even though Brother Smith put this phrase on me, hey, I'll accept it and wear it with a little, well, please, uh, thankfulness. I'm a body brat, and I'm well pleased of it. So I'm thankful to be here. Praise the Lord. Well, it, it does feel good to be back in the house of God and back with the saints of Little Rock. <clears throat> I appreciate all the, you know, those that in this church that <clears throat> helped this church in its beginning. You know, the Bible says David served his, he served his generation and they served theirs <clears throat> and left a, a, uh, a foundation here for us to work off of, and I'm thankful for that. And then I'm thankful for this generation that we have here today. Uh, we've got to serve him in our generation. And, of course, this is a, this is a historic time. It's almost, you know... I said to somebody today, I said, there's something going on <clears throat> that we're not aware of <laughs> with, <clears throat> with all of this that is going on, but I do believe the Lord is in it. Uh, I don't really, <clears throat> somebody asked me, said, do you think God's trying to tell us ministers in the body that we don't need all these meetings because... <laughs> We've had all of them canceled this year. You know, our next camp meeting is supposed to be October the 1st through the 4th, so we'll see. <clears throat> and then uh, Brother Dial is supposed to have a minister's meeting in November. We'll just have to see how that goes. We don't know yet what will happen when they begin to release these, this, you know, uh, what do they call it, more to, uh Mitigation, and uh, you know, has had us. You know, there's so much going on when you listen to the. You know, in fact, I've about quit listening to the news because I don't know who to believe. 
uh, you know, you, it's, it, every bit of it's confusing. I personally feel like, oh, somebody asked me, you know, that about them, if God was trying to, I said, I don't think God is trying to tell us ministry not to have meetings. I just think we're suffering with what's happening in the world. And, but what I do think God is probably doing is getting this world ready for a, a beast system to be set up. The world going to come together <clears throat> before it's over with. There's several things that has to transpire. If you've been listening to the Thursday night services, I've not tried to take our Sunday services, but the, th- the Thursday night broadcast or live uh, sessions that, we, that I've had which I was trying to kind of set back today because I've been getting to talk every week. But, but uh, you know, I thought maybe some of y'all wanted to talk and wanted me to hush. But anyway, uh, so I on Thursdays I dedicated that here recently to giving forth the succession of things that have to transpire prophetically before the end of the Gentile world and the beginning of the thousand year millennium so we went through several things uh, and Sister Fisher just because it took me 25 years to figure out what the book of Revelation was saying it won't take you that long because God gave it to me I remember Brother Langer said it took him 25 years to know anything about the coming of the Lord he used to say the Lord said do you know anything about my coming and he'd say no I don't but then he'd tell us that it took me 25 years to figure out the coming of the Lord. And, uh, but it didn't take me that long to get it because I just got it from him. It didn't take me just a few years, you know. And uh, at least his, his, you know, where he was at on it. And uh, so we're still working on it, but, <clears throat> but uh, anyway, hopefully the Lord... Uh, who was it? Brother McGowan told me this morning. He said, I've been listening to you, and it's the muddy water's getting clear. <laughs> you know, or he said, not really all that muddy, but, you know, things are getting clear. And that, and, you know, and I understand what I meant when I said, if you don't get it, I just meant you. Some of these things, you know, the Bible is a detailed book, and it's got, it takes a lot to understand the Bible. And some books in it, so, you know, <clears throat> somebody starts talking about something you hadn't heard a lot about, especially prophecy, it gets, it does get kind of cloudy. And, uh, but, the, but the more you hear it, uh, the more it'll come clear to you. So, anyway, I, I do feel like that uh, there, there's nothing going to take place. This God's never caught off guard. He's in control of everything. So what's taking place in the world today, you can believe that God's involved in it. <clears throat> and uh, he's in charge of it. He's not going to go outside of his boundaries of what uh, he wants to take place or allow to take place. We've often had a saying in this body that you're either working with God or you're working for him because he's in control. And if you won't work with him, he'll use you to work for him. You know, the world, the, the, the heart of a king is in the hand of God. And uh, the Lord's in charge of what's going on in this world, and he's in charge of every king and every nation. He sets up kings and he tears them down, the Bible says. And so <clears throat> God's in charge of what's taking place in this entire world. Now, there's a lot of things that God doesn't do because it doesn't interfere with his plan. He just lets nature take its course. There's such a thing as reaping what you sow in life. That's just a natural law. And, you know, uh, we will reap what we sow. God set this creation in order so that that would take place. And he just He lets nature take its course, even... Uh, even... Uh, coincidences, things that happen by chance. Uh, 
Let's let's look at that scripture right quick. Ecclesiastes. Y'all may have to help me find it, but we'll find it. it. That says that chance happens to them all. I believe something to that. Well, see if I can find that. Nine, nine, eleven. Okay, thank you, Brother Painter. All right. Let me. Uh, verse ten says, "Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest." In other words, when you're dead, you're dead. You, there, there, you ain't gonna do nothing after you go to the grave. Then he said, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. So <clears throat> chance, you know, we're subject to chance. Now, God can change that. I mean, the Lord can step in anything that would hinder His will for your life or, uh, you know, what is a, a scripture says that the angel of the Lord encampeth around them that fear Him and He delivers them. So, you, you may be going through something that just by chance. But God can step in, you know, that's the thing, is he, he's got angels that's encamping around you and your personal life that he will deliver you. He may let you go through things by chance. I think that happens all the time. You, you, might, you might get coronavirus by chance or the flu or something else, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean God isn't going to help you and God deliver you. And so sometimes the Lord allows things to happen, but that doesn't, that doesn't remove God's hand from, from deliverance. Uh, sometimes he lets things happen. He'll use it to his benefit. You know, some of, some of the things that happens to us by chance is, is uh, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, in other words, we're reaping what we sowed. It's, it's, it, it just happens by chance. You know, sometimes we ignorantly sow something and we reap for it. And, uh, and some of that comes about, you know, we didn't necessarily, it wasn't designed. God didn't put it in our pathway to make it happen. God just lets it, lets, it, he just lets it happen. Then he uses a lot of things for his benefit. But he also, the Bible says, you have to bring a balance because he says that the steps of a good man is ordered of the Lord. So God can order your, he can order your steps, but that doesn't mean every step you take. You get out of step with God quite often, if you rather you believe it or not. You know, it takes, it takes serving God for quite a while to get to where you, you can take every step that he wants you to take. So I know it can be done because Jesus said, I always do those things that please my father. Well, I'm working on that, but I don't know. I'm not, I can't make that statement right now. Anyway, uh, I agree with Brother Painter. I'm thankful for all the mothers that are here, and and uh, you know we want you to know how much we do appreciate you. Your mothers are special people. <laughs> they got they've got something that men don't have. I found that out when Michael was a little bitty baby. When, you know, I could sleep all night. Sometimes I'd wake up and she'd be in the other room taking care of him. And two o'clock in the morning, and I wondered how she knew. You know, I didn't know nothing. I was sleeping like a baby myself. But she'd be in there, you know, taking care of him. He, she, he didn't have to cry. She just had something in her that made her go check on him ever so often or, you know, it's just, it's just a mother thing. <laughs> you know, this ma maternal thing that women have, God built them that way. Thank God for that. 
uh, every once in a while I notice how, you know, sometimes men give up on their kids, but mamas never do, almost never. If they're, if they're a good mother, if they're a godly mother especially, they won't give up on their children. And they, they're the ones that keeps, keeps daddy from giving up sometimes. You know, it's just that's something special that they have that, that, that uh, you know. I, my wife, she'll submit to me about on anything except for the kids and the grandkids, you know. And uh, she, she will, you know, she hides money for them. You know, I, I tell her, we're not buying all them kids all that stuff. But she, she, she does things that I don't even know about. She hoards money so she can give it to the kids. I said, you don't need to give them kids all that money. They don't need that money. Well, it's just like talking to a wall. You know, know, if you want to get in trouble with your wife, just mess with her kids. Just get contrary with her concerning them kids and you'll get in trouble. So I've told several men this. I'll give you this counsel right over the pulpit. Women live in a small world and it consists of their home and their kids. Everything circles around that and if you don't take care of that, you're going to have trouble in life. So you've got to learn how to handle that. Yeah, That's kids. That's kids. All of them. All of them, all the way down, I don't care if they're great, great, great grandkids. As long as they're breathing, them's their kids, you know. So uh, they'll be in charge of their kids, their grandkids, and their great grandkids. What even the Bible says, even to the third and the fourth generation, God visits the sins of the fathers, even to the third generation. And fourth generation, fourth generation to see, mama, grandma, me, me, mama, grandma, great-grandma. Sometimes great-great-grandma, but very few people knew their great-great-grandma. Anybody in here knew your great-great-grandma? See, they're normally dead by then. But I remember, I remember Grandma Keeling, which was, Ethel Smith, which was dad's mom's mom. That was my great-grandma. She died when I was in the second grade, and she was in her 90s. So they normally, but but see, the reason God visits those sins to the third and even fourth generations, because if you're alive, like, see, I'm I'm now, I've got my son and, and his kids and their kids. I'm already into the, I'm great grandpa. Fixing to be five times. That's why Michael and Cindy aren't here. Brittany's fixing to have her third kid. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know what got into them. It's that maternal thing. You know, uh, I could say some things right here, but it's too touchy. I won't. I won't say a word. <clears throat> but there's people here that I could get real touchy with, <laughs> with about all this. <laughs> but because uh, they've been my, you know, they've been under my ministry a long time. But uh, the Lord, you know, in other words, I influence my son. And anything I influence him wrong in the flesh, God has to visit that. God has to deal with him because of the influence that I had on his life. And then his kids, my grandkids. See, my grandkids, their daddy is the big boss to them, but I'm bigger boss than their daddy. They, they may not have to, you know, in other words, they may not have to put up with me discipline like daddy, but they know that I have a... a they know that I had to have a, you know, a place as their ancestry that's even higher than their dad because no, their dad doesn't recognize anybody higher than his dad. 
If you raise your children right in God, that's the way it'll be. But anything you do, anything I do that they see or that they're influenced by, God will have to influence, God will have to deal with them about that. And what I put in their daddy that he deals with them, that I influenced him, God will have to deal with him about it. That's the third generation. And when it gets to greats, it's not as bad. It's fading away <laughs> as far as what influence I've got on these little kids, you know. But I do have some influence on them. Of course, I started out early. Sister Smith and I grew up together. What I mean is we started out as just kids. Most of us did, didn't we? And uh, so Sister Smith and I have been together, what, 52 years? What, and and, and uh, you know, we've got now my son's. And he's 51. He will be this year, and and or you know in the fall. And um, is he 51 already, honey? And he's already 51. I guess it's going by. I figured, you know, I can't catch up. Anyway, you know, then he's got Andrew's 30. He'll be 33. My grandson. And then his oldest son is eight, be nine this fall. So I'm still 39. So <laughs> that's where I quit. <laughs> Y'all keep telling if you want to. But I'm just 39 again every year. Anyway, uh, that's how God, you know, God visits us and and it's amazing about God because he, he, um, he lets you be an individual and He lets you live your life and he, lets, he does not predestinate everything that happens to you. He's not, he doesn't do that. Not any more than you do your kids that way. Now, now you do, I mean, God, you know, I do believe God watches over us and and, uh, you know, the Lord, in fact, <clears throat> I could show you scripture, but I won't get off on it today, where God seals people in their foreheads before they make the bride. I can show you scripture on that. And so, <clears throat> you know, you're, you're sealed. You've got a seal in your life. You just got to get that seal. Yeah, you got to get it. You got to get it. You got to get the ultimate finish to it. You know, I feel like I'm sealed. The Lord's, His putting His seal in my forehead. He already has, but it, it's not. I hadn't finished. It's not finished yet. That's not a finished product yet. And uh, I know some of y'all are saying, "Where's that at in the Bible?" It's in the. It's in the fifth seal. In the fifth. Yes. The Remember the, the scorpions, which was Mohammedism coming out against Catholicism. It said it was given power to hurt men for f five months. That's 150 prophetical years. And he said, hurt not them that has my seal in their foreheads, the seal of the Lord God in their foreheads. There wasn't nobody making the bride in, the, in Mohammedism or Catholic Church either one at that time. So they had a seal. They were they they had God's seal in their life, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a finished product. And uh, <clears throat> but uh, I'm just thankful for this God in heaven. That's why. Let me read just a little bit to you here in the 34th Psalm. It says, "I will bless the Lord at all times." His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Can you spit that through your mask? <laughs> Can you, you know, that's the other thing. Are we, going, are we supposed to wear a mask or not? Some people says, don't wear a mask. I listened to one lady on there. She said, if you've got coronavirus and you're wearing a mask, you're killing yourself. Your body trying to get rid of all that and you're sucking it right back in. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Who do you believe in all of this? Well, 
I was thankful to hear our governor, Asa Hutchison, say that no, he gave no directives ever to the church. He's never said that a church can't have worship. He just said, I've gave guidelines because he said our constitution has safety of separation of church and state that protects people to worship God. But he said, I am thankful for the pastors that have followed our guidelines and that love their people enough that's tried to protect them. And we've tried to do that. The Bible does tell us to obey uh, those in government as much as we can. We're to try to to be, uh, you know, to... Uh, to work with those as much as we can be at peace with all everybody, even our government, or I think there will be a time when we probably won't be able to do that altogether. I mean, we, may, we may have to go to having churches in homes before it's over with, you know. But <clears throat> thank God right now we've got freedom. We've got freedom to worship God right here in Little Rock, Arkansas. And we've got a nice church building that God's gave us to worship in. Anyway, it says, My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. By the way, Brother Paul, it's good to have you today. It's good to have Brother Paul Wilson here with us today. It's it's done my heart good to see him come in today. Uh, I thought a lot of your dad. And... uh, of course, I, I love your mom and your sister, brother and sister Crafton, and the family, and you, you know, uh, this is how it is. When you, when you got, you've got a connection with God's people. You can't get away from that connection. You know, God, uh, that's, that's how God deals with people. God, you know, it, I mean, he could deal with somebody in, I've said this many times, in Timbuktu. Somebody told me where that was. I still don't remember what they said. Uh, Where's it at? Africa? I still don't know if that's true, but it's Tim, I've heard of Timbuktu. I don't even really know if there's a Timbuktu. But that sounds kind of African, don't it? Anyway... God can deal with anybody anywhere. The, the thing about it is, is for God to just lead one person. Uh, that's not how God works. He, he did start off with Abraham that way, but he developed Abraham, gave him a son, Isaac, and then Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons, and that became the 12 tribes of Israel. And God works through a group of people and gets so much more done that way and that's how God works. God works through our families. You know, I had a mother that was a God-fearing Holy Ghost woman. That was my salvation. That's why I'm here today is because I had a connection with God and God's people. My family had a connection and God had a way to deal with me. You know, if you're, if you're from a family out here that's ungodly, and they, they don't have any connection with God, then it's a lot harder for God to deal with you. That You don't have any influence. But both sides of my family had connection with God. They were God-fearing people. And that affected me, you know. I can remember when I finally moved out of home and, and uh, got on my own. Me and this other boy lived together. We shared an apartment and I was, I was backslid. And we ran around together, and I'd done things I shouldn't have done, done. And we'd go home at night from out, you know, doing what we ought not have been doing. I, I wasn't a bad guy, but I still was kind of ornery. <laughs> that puts it lightly. <laughs> One time we came out of a nightclub, I'll tell this. And he was, we hit, was in his car. And he was about three sheets in the wind. Neither we was both below age. You know. 
And so I got the keys from his car because I was going to drive for him. Because I, I had that kind of fear in me, this not to go too far with anything, you know, because, you know, I thought, I can't die. <laughs> I mean, I'm a God's child. I've got to get straightened out before this is over with. <clears throat> so he gets in trouble inside and, and they call, they got in a fight and they call the law and the law gets him and the law's lead. And when I seen the law's getting him, I got out of there. Well, here come the law had him by the arm. I had the keys to his car. And he's hollering, Smith, come over here and help me whoop this guy. It's just one of them. We can handle it. And, that guy, and the policeman said, hey. He said, do you know this guy? I said, I, I said, I've never seen that guy before in my life. I said, he, I think that guy's drunk or something. I just walked over and got his car and started it up and backed it up. And he was hollering, I'm going to kill you! I'm going to kill you! <laughs> I just drove off. And they took him to jail. Anyway, that was, you know, that's bad to tell because I'm not proud of it, but... I'm, I'm telling you that because you know, I got in some situations where I shouldn't have been, but at night we'd go home and go to bed and he'd be over there snoring and I'd be over there saying, now I lay me down to sleep. <laughs> I'd say, God, forgive me. I, I don't know if I'm going to straighten up tomorrow or not, but I need forgiveness tonight <laughs> because I, you know, I knew I needed to get straightened out. I had that kind of influence in my life. I lived in misery, you know, because I was trying to serve two masters. <clears throat> anyway, the guy should have been glad because I'm the guy that went home, got in my piggy bank, went down to the police station and bailed him out of jail. You know, I made sure that cop was gone before I went in there, but anyway. <laughs> Oh, God, thank you for getting me out of all that crazy stuff before I ever decided to really get my life straightened out. Well, <clears throat> I wasn't in the body, Brother Keith, so, you know, I wasn't a body brat. Maybe you never pulled none of them shenanigans, but, you know. But you can, as a body brat, pull shenanigans, you know, which I'm sure he did, trust me. Anyway... <clears throat> I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Verse 4 in Psalms 34. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. It says, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. God, you know, here's the thing. You could have, your life can be messed up. And if you really hit a place of humility and come before the Lord and re really repent, dedicate your life to serve Him, He'll He'll He will erase for judgment. He'll He'll do away with your whole past as far as bringing it to judgment. He He will forgive you for everything, and He'll He'll never bring it up again. I mean, you and I have to work on that. You know, somebody do you wrong, you, and then they want a forgiveness, and you forgive them, but don't ever bring it up again. Mm. Now, let me say something about that. Because just because, you know, that doesn't mean I've had people tell me, well, you know, you're supposed to forgive me. Well, I'll forgive you but I ain't dumb enough to trust you again yet till you earn it. <laughs> I'm not, you know, when somebody does me wrong, you know, a dog bite me four or five every time I stick my hand out to feed him or pet him, I ain't dumb enough to keep sticking my hand out. You know, and, and I can forgive somebody. In fact, I have to. The Bible requires it. Jesus required me. He forgave me while I was, before I was born, he fixed it that I could be forgiven. Died for me while I was still in my sins, the Bible said. But you, you can be wise enough to say, well, I'm not holding that and I'm, I have no vengeance. That's not my place. That's God's place. 
fact, the Bible says not to judge another man's servant. He's talking about God. Don't, don't judge God's people. That, that is you. It's not your place to exercise God's judgment on them. But that doesn't mean that you, you can't take the position of realizing that I can't work. You can't always work with everybody. You can't trust everybody. And, but you cannot hold vengeance in your heart against them. Here's the best way to do it, is just say, I realize, <clears throat> let, let, me, let me tell you this. This might help you a little bit. My dad was an alcoholic, and my dad made a lot of mistakes. He was a good man, but he had sin had a hold of him. And he done me wrong in several things that he did. He did my mother wrong in several things. It caused me to have not the right feelings against him. But do you know in me serving God that I've finally come to the place to realize that my dad sin's what caused him to do the thing. Sin had a hold to him. He was imprisoned by certain things. And I could forgive him because sin caused that in his life. But I knew his real heart that he really wanted to be a good man. And I was able to forgive him, not have any vengeance or nothing in my heart against him. I didn't, it wasn't that way when I was a kid. I slept as a little boy. I can remember when I was in the fifth grade sleeping with a ball bat under my bed because he beat my mother. And I'd, I'd get, He never beat her in front of me and got by with it without having to beat me too. And so he, I lived in fear a long time when I was a little boy and he was an alcoholic and going through a rough place in life. But I, and I had hatred in my heart for a while towards him. But I got to a place that I loved him and I could forgive him for all the things that was hurtful that sin caused in his life. And it caused me to have a pity for him and prayer for him. And before he died, I got to see him get on his knees and get back to God and serve God for several or quite some time before he died. Pray with him to get the Holy Ghost. And, and you know, he, uh, the last time I saw him, he hugged me in, in the hospital and kissed me right in the mouth. Now, you know, that might not sound like much from a father to a son, but my daddy, I could count on that hand right there how many times I ever knew about him hugging me, much less kissing me, much less kissing me in the mouth when I was in my 30s. <laughs> Was I, in my, was I in my 40s when he died? I might have been in my 40s. But I'm just telling you, you can, God can, and God can touch you to understand that, you know, what's causing people to do the things they do. You know, I mean, I used to, you know, Jesus told his, his uh, he said uh, to his disciples, said, if you got, Faith is a grain of mustard seed. You can say unto this mountain, uh, be ye cast into the sea. You know, I used to have trouble with that just but driving down the road and somebody, car, you know, you ever had road rage? <laughs> into the sea! <laughs> That's where I'd put some people. <laughs> Just in a, I don't even know who they are. They're just driving the car, and maybe they did so just do it something. Maybe they were not even paying attention that made me want to cast them in the sea. Of course, that wasn't what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about those apostles having enough faith to, to take mountains of religion, of Judaism, and put them, remove their influence and call it cause them to become a part of the world as far as the people of God were concerned where they no longer influence them. But, but you know, and, and it's something how we sometimes use scriptures like that, you know, to our own benefit. Anyway, uh, let, me, let me read this scripture right here. Verse 7. And the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. I know 
that we don't 100% trust the Lord yet. But we are working on it, ain't we? Now, you got to have a relationship with God to really trust him in everything. You know, he, I can trust that he may be helping you, but when it comes down to him helping me in some of my situations, I'm wondering whether or not God's really in on this. <laughs> of course, you know, he can be trusted, saints. You can trust him. And ultimately, that's where your trust is if you're sealed. You know, if you've got this seal working in your forehead, God's called you, he's, he's added you, he's counting you worthy, he's counting you righteous. That's that seal of Jesus Christ, what Jesus done. Your commitment to him and that born again experience that you have has fixed a seal in heaven. In fact, uh, how did how did Paul say that in Ephesians one? Let me let me read it to you right quick, and I'll get down from here. But uh, I just I'm liking this having church deal. <laughs> there, I do have Ephesians in my Bible. Oh, uh, it's in the 13th verse. It said, in whom ye also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed. Praise God. Aren't you glad you're sealed? There's been a, there's been a seal placed in your life. Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of your inheritance. That's that seal in your forehead. The reason it's in your forehead because it's in your thinking. God has to deal with your mind to get a commitment out of you. And, and, he, and for, for it to be an earnest of your inheritance, you've got to have some faith. You're justified by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. So when God deals with you, however he deals with you, and you really turn to God. And let me say this before I sit down. The, you know, wasn't it Ephesus, one of the churches in the book of Revelation and one of the seven churches that the Lord had John write a letter to? And he told them, he said, he said, I've got somewhat against you. He said, you have left your first love. And I mentioned this the other night. Do you remember your first love? You remember when God saved you of your sins? You remember when you got that feeling like I'm I feel so clean. I feel God done something in my life. It's not just a hope so, maybe so, but when you really have an experience with God. And he washes your sins away. And you just feel so, God, he's so real to you at that time. And then even if you didn't receive the Holy Ghost when you repented of your sins, when you did receive the Holy Ghost, that just enhanced everything with your relationship with God and his love for you. How did Paul say it's a shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, the love of God? And, and you go to work on this relationship with this Savior that you found that he finally found you, really, is the way it is. But then as you start serving God and you start trying to make get all of the pieces of the puzzle to come together for you so that you can understand a greater, uh, have a greater understanding of the picture of what God's purpose is for you. Because he has an eternal purpose for you. It's his eternal purpose, but he's, if, if you came to God, it's because he wooed you. Jesus said, no man cometh unto me except my father woos him. 
draws him. God, he gets after you. How's he get after you? Well, he's had all that influence in your life since he was, since however he got influence with you, whether it's through your great grandma, great grandpa, your daddy, your mama, Aunt Susie, Aunt whoever. Some of these people, Brother Keith's talking about, some of them I know, some of them I did, some of them I don't. It don't matter. They, they were influences that God used. And, you know, God, you know, but here's what I was going to say. As you begin to serve God and work out your salvation, you can get up in the, you can get caught up in the, the mechanics, I'll say, of trying to figure out God's order, the doctrines, understanding, you know, uh, all of the integral parts of God's kingdom and, and, and the church of today, the body of Christ, that you can, you can get sidetracked and lose your first love. You can quit working on that relationship. Saints, let's, let's make sure we don't lose our first love. Let's go, let's keep working on that intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Get in that prayer closet on a regular basis. Keep talking to him. Keep letting him bless you. Let the Spirit of God touch you. Press into it often enough that you keep that first love going. And all these mechanics I'm talking about are necessary But don't let that sidetrack you from keeping that first love, that flame, keep it burning. Keep that working in your life. Those places where you, and, and almost everybody's got a different way of touching God. You know, they got a different manifestation of how to, how to get a hold of Him, you know. You know, you know for me, I, now I talk to God. I pray. I pray a lot. Sometimes it's just you know, in my day I just talk to Him just for for a few minutes, maybe just a few seconds, maybe praying for some of y'all. I just something will come up in my mind about you, and I'll talk to God about you right quick. Then I get busy back on what I'm doing. But you know, when I really want to get a hold of God. I lay down on the floor and I start groaning and start praying and start crying and start groaning and pressing into the Spirit of God to get a hold of God. And there, I got to get in, I got to get a hold of Him. I got to get beyond myself and anything else that hinders me. I got to get alone sometimes. I, I don't have to be alone. I can do it in the church, so I can lay down on the floor we used to have prayer meetings. I'd come into the church and get prostrate and start groaning and crying. Before long, I'd get a hold of God. <laughs> For me, I, I, I've got a certain way that I need to get a hold of Him. And I've got to get shut up in a closet with Him and, and get my emotions geared towards Him. And uh, then, you know... Then there's times that I like to be still and just let him talk to me, see if he wants to say something to me. And uh, anyway, whatever it takes, keep your first love going with the Lord. Keep keep it alive. Work on it. Don't don't let yourself get sidetracked of it. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, have have we got some? Flowers for our sisters, our mothers. Well, if you, some of you ushers, why don't y'all give them to them? We, I asked Brother Fisher to make sure that we didn't let Mother's Day. I'm so glad we was able to have church on Mother's Day. <laughs> that's, that's a day I wouldn't want us to be. Uh, missing on. I want y'all to be thinking while they're getting ready on that. Let me say a few couple things about this. 
I think we could actually have Bible study and breakfast um, because I think most families sit together in tables. I think there's enough spacing we could probably do that. But preparing it, that's another thing is, you know, we need people to prepare it or, you know, we might want to just prepare a light preparation for a few Sundays. Like just, maybe just uh, donuts and coffee or, uh, or, you know, maybe we could have just some uh, breakfast tacos or something that could be prepared and just warmed up here. Anyway, some of y'all need to help me. Some of you women that knows about that better than me needs to help me. Sometimes there could just be a family that's already together that that family could do it, you know. And uh, so anyway, I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking we can get back to that here pretty soon. And then Wednesday nights, uh, does anybody know if the if the mayor has lifted the, it's midnight now? Okay. Um, would y'all like that? Would y'all like for us to have church keep just keep it at seven thirty since the curfew's been lifted, or would you like for us to come early a little while so we're not getting home late this time of you know at seven? Would you rather have it at seven for right now? Everybody wants to have it at seven. Raise your hand. Everybody don't want it, raise your hand. Don't want it. I don't want it just losing, but <laughs> you want to have 715? <laughs> hey, God. You mean 730. Huh? I did too. 730. Keep it at 730. Some people have a hard time getting here right now at 730. All right, well, let's try. Let's try the 7.30 this next Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, all right? Let's try it See, see how that works. And Y'all can go ahead and pass those out. I'm just, I'm filling time and I'm running out of filler. Huh? Yeah? We, got, we have something besides what we're handing out to the sisters. Uh, the church, we also want to show honor to mother of our assembly here, as well as uh, Sister Crow, we want to get something there for her as well. So we want to say thank you. We love you very much. Uh, I'll say also on behalf of Brother Smith and Brother Painter, and myself, and the ministry of the church, we love you and we thank you for all that you do for us. Amen. <laughs> I miss Brother Crow. But I'm glad Sister Crow's still here, and and uh, I have no doubt she'll get to see him again. But uh, I miss him. But I, I'm thankful for. We need all these, you know, these uh, seasoned saints. We need them. We need their example and. Just being here just does something for an assembly. It sure does. So I um, appreciate Sister Crow and the other sisters that are uh, getting up in age too. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, I guess sir. Um Am I leaving something out? Is there anything? Let me let me let me take up prayer requests while they're passing this out, and uh, then we'll have the ushers come and receive your tithes and offerings. I do want to say to you, so many of you have been so faithful to even mail in your tithes and offerings during this time that has kept the finances of the church up, you know, and that's really been important. And I want you to know how much I appreciate it. And how much I'm thankful for it. Just a good, good giving people that, that are faithful to give to the Lord. <clears throat> you know, 
I won't teach on it right now, but I've always tried to tell people this way. If you want to know if God honors giving your first fruits, I would just say to you, look around this church and the people that are the most well-off financially are generally the biggest givers that we have that's always been faithful. And God never, he never reneges on his promise. You recognize him, he'll recognize you. It's hard to get in your life. It wasn't hard for me because my mother was, she planted that in us. My wife would tell you that we were always faithful. And that was just planted in me from a child. I just am thankful for all of you saints. Um, Prayer air conditioner kicked off? <laughs> Somebody, you might order. Maybe, here, let me check it for you. Yes, Sister Fisher. Sister who? Oh, Sister Alexander. Okay, yes, let's remember her in prayer. Sister Abraham sure wanted to be here. I told her she might ought to. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, all the air conditioners are kicked off. I don't know if they ever kicked on. It's over? It's ki- <laughs> when did it kick off? I don't think so. We don't have them set for that. When do they set to kick off, brother? Matthew, where are you at? Three o'clock. I didn't put it in the schedule. You're the guy. Then they ain't never kicked on. It's just been cool outside. So, anyway. Ask for to pray who? Pam who? Fleener? Yeah, Pam Fleener. She's got, she's got lymphoma cancer in Wilberton, Oklahoma. Remember her sister Holly? Brother Johnson, you're talking about Brother Michael Johnson in Oklahoma City. Brother Painter, Sister Ann Thompson. She she's actually got sunburned real bad. She had her dad's funeral yesterday outside, and she enjoyed it, but she didn't realize she was sitting in the sun getting a sunburn, and she's burnt up today. She said, I can't. "So pray for her." Yes, Ann. Sister Oates, Brother Tommy Oates, you know, passed away. And by the way, our church, we sent her a $500 offering to help her, you know, during this time. And she was so thankful for it. I sent it to Brother Dave's and told him you can, you don't have to tell her we sent it. It can be alms if that's what you want. But he did tell her and she was thankful. Sister, uh, yes, Sister Amber. All right. What else? Sister Sister Brenda? Who did? Okay. Passed away with coronavirus. All right. Yes, Keith. Okay. Brother Don. Brother Chuck Millsap in Wichita. He still really needs our prayers. He's home now, but he's not really much better. They just don't know what to do for him. Sister uh, Henderson. Brother Jerry York. Okay. 
Is there something happened to him that I don't know about? Does he just need... Brother Scott, you know anything about your dad? He he has he had you know he did go to the hospital and he had, he's got vertigo. He's got some problems with vertigo. If something's happened to him since then, I didn't know it. But he he was fearful about coming to church just yet because his health hasn't been real good. So he was going to stay out maybe for a week or two longer than most of us. Sister Gladys, huh? Sherry Boyd, yes, she's got. She was tested for Corona, but she doesn't is negative. She but she got the flu or something. She got the crud. Sister Holly. Hallelujah. Yeah. So. We're thankful for that. We've been praying for Sister Holly and for her job situation for some time. Sister Crow? All right. Yes, let's keep remembering Sister Crow. Also, my wife's really having trouble with her sciatic nerve lately. If you'd pray for Sister Smith. Keep praying for Brother Daniels. He he certainly needs to stay on your prayer list. Sister Ann? All right. All right. Remember, their brother has cancer. Sister Hannah. Oh, yes. All right. Perkins family, yes. Also keep remembering little sister Bella Veely that has cancer in Georgia. Brother Veely's daughter, granddaughter. All right, you want to stand with me and ask God to, if you ushers will come, we'll, we'll receive the tithes and offerings. And I know we're kind of running over today, but it just we just don't, I just hate to leave, don't you? <laughs> All right, thank you, Lord. God, for your goodness to us, your blessings on our lives, Jesus. We give you praise today. Oh, God, Lord, we love you and appreciate your goodness to us. I ask you to just take our petitions, Lord, as we lift them up here today. Brother and Sister Weaver, Brother Shelby Weaver, all these that have been mentioned here today, oh, God. Reach out and touch these needs that are particularly that are serious health needs, oh God. And then touch those, Lord, that couldn't be here today and, and uh, touch our leaders in America. Help them, oh God, throughout the world, oh Lord. Help the situation that we're in, your people. God, protect your people. We're thankful today that... Uh, for your protective covering, your hand on our lives. We give you praise for that. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God, go with your people. Cover them and protect them. Oh, God, we give you praise for your many, many blessings and covering that's over our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen, amen. All right, you can be seated. God bless you as you give today.
Amém.